is the uh, trail maintenance workshop. Um, the agenda, we already did the welcome and introductions. This is a virtual classroom instruction. It was originally scheduled to be held at a neighbor of uh, Rinton Brook Sanctuary in a room that overlooks the Hudson. Uh, but we obviously can't do that. And then we were going to do some hands-on field work outside after the uh, classroom. So we're just doing the virtual classroom. Um, you should feel free to ask questions during the meeting. You can either enter it into a question into the chat. You should make sure you address it to everyone or you can raise your hand and you do that by selecting participants at the bottom of the screen and then selecting the raise hand icon and Anne will help us uh, navigate that. And we will send you these slides and a link to the recording of the workshop after it's over. A little bit about me, I'm a longtime SMRA member. We joined in 1978 just after we moved here I'm a board member and chair of the finance committee, active on a lot of committees and sanctuaries. And my wife, Ellen, works part-time in the SMRA office. And I'm also active in the New York, New Jersey Trail Conference, I maintain a trail in Fonstock. Um, I go out with Mary Ayers and, and others on the weekly Westchester Trail Tramps maintenance crew we go to places like uh, T-Town, George's Island, and others, although the crews have been uh, shut down due to the coronavirus. They just are letting individual maintainers back on the trails. Um, maintainers take a course called Trail Maintenance 101 before they become a maintainer, and I've taught that course. I borrowed a few slides and many of the ideas from there, but have adopted it um, to our uh, special situations. And I chaired a committee that just completed rewriting the trail conferences, trail maintenance manual, which will go out to all maintainers. So I wanna thank you all for, um, for volunteering or expressing an interest to volunteer. Um, we make a distinction between trail walkers and trail maintainers. I'll describe that in a moment, but they provide a really valuable service and that's to ensure that our trails are passable and safe. And this is especially important during the COVID-19 era. Um, we found that our trails are much more heavily used than, than previously, I think particularly at Prine and, and Brinton. And so it's important to keep an eye on them and make sure they're in good condition. And it can be, um, can be a really uh, rewarding and fun experience. It's a great way to get outside in a beautiful location and, and to get to know a sanctuary really well. So what does a trail walker do? So first of all, if you're interested in being a trail walker, you should contact the office and discuss it with them. They'll probably put you in contact with me, but let them know where you want to be a trail walker. Or we can recommend a place. And a trail walker visits a sanctuary or a trail in a sanctuary, in a larger sanctuary regularly. Ideally, you do it about once a month. I think Dave Watson goes into Prine about once a day. Yeah. Um, but uh, ideally about once a month. And if not that, quarterly or every other month, so four to six times a year. And it's also good to go out after a strong, uh, a strong storm to check for damage for blowdowns and, and such. Uh, a trail walker picks up litter, so you should bring along a trash bag. And you report on conditions and especially problems. And we give a, a link here to um, where that form is located. It's pretty easy to uh, get on, the, on our web. So what, is a, what does a maintainer do? Well, it does every, everything that a trail walker does, plus some light maintenance. And this includes 
trimming back vegetation that may be intruding onto the trail and clearing small, small blowdowns uh, that have, uh, could be obstructing the trail using a handsaw. And we don't permit uh, chainsaws. We don't permit our maintainers to use chainsaws. Um, you can possibly do uh, painting blazes if you're interested. Um, you should be experienced and properly trained. We currently have a few people who do that. But if you're interested, you can, um, you can get experience doing this and get training by uh, volunteering for a blazing work outing. And we're likely to have such an outing uh, out to the Graf Sanctuary uh, within the next uh, month or two. So when you go out, you should always think about safety first. And that's especially true uh, during this pandemic. So here are some special precautions during the coronavirus pandemic. Um, you should avoid visiting the sanctuary during the most uh, busy weekend times. We found that uh, these days, weekdays, uh, especially early in the mornings are best. You should bring a mask with you. You should put it on whenever else, whenever someone else is near you and move to the side of the trail and, and face outwards so that people can pass you and you can think about it as giving the other walking <laughs> the right of way. Um, and there should be a poll. Let's see, how do I get that? I thought I could do that while I was screen sharing, but I'm gonna to have to stop sh sharing the screen. And we're gonna put up a poll. This is a three question poll. If you could take a moment to do that. And there are three questions, which are, what sanctuaries have you visited recently? And you can check on all that apply. Second question, what, what constitutes recently? Well, what? I'm not going to, you know. The last year? The last <laughs> the month? The last year, sure. Uh, what, and, and what sanctuaries have you noticed a significantly increased usage compared to before the pandemic? And you can click uh, more than one answer. And if you haven't been there since the pandemic started, you, you there's nothing to click. To click. Uh, just skip question. the question, Valerie. It's no, no, no big deal. <laughs> and if you can answer the third question is when you're out and you see other hikers, what percentage of them would you, do you think have been, been wearing other masks? And that's uh, answer, answer one choice there. Are you seeing the results? I'm not I, seeing the results. Are you, do you see the poll in your, in your window? Yeah, I can see the results. Um, but I can also share them after we end the polling. Okay. Um, and take a screenshot. So has everybody had a chance to do some clicking? I only um, answered the first one, but I couldn't submit it. So uh, answer all of them to submit. Yeah, you got to scroll down to the bottom. No, I did. I clicked it, but yeah, it doesn't seem to be. had the same problem. I have to click oh. on something in each answer in order to submit. Oh, yeah. that's pretty yeah. annoying. Yeah. <laughs> well, we should have put none of the above. Okay, so. All right, we're learning. All right. Um, right, so. Well, I um, hear the results in. Yeah, so, uh, and asking people which ones that they uh, had visited um, nine out of nine who responded to that question have been at Brinson Brook. One out of nine at Choate. Three of. Are you sharing that now, Ann? I'm not sure. Um, let's see. Shall we end it, folks? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Let me uh, share the results. Are you seeing the shared poll results? So there seems to be a. Are you seeing the shared results? So. Yeah. I'm, I'm yeah, I, I can see it. Yeah, I can see it. Yeah. I can see it. Yeah, I'm we have two. With that. But that's okay. 
Yeah. Um, so I'm going to actually do a uh, screenshot here. Uh, so you can see that uh, everybody who responded, I'm going to take some pictures and send them to you folks. Uh, everybody who responded had visited Brinton Brook. Um, only one has visited Choate, about a third to Graf and Haas. Uh, only one, that must be you, Valerie, at Pinecliff. But I couldn't submit mine, so that can't be me. Well, it may have tallied it, who knows. Uh, and we like technology here. And <laughs> about half have been to Prime. Shall I talk about the second question? So has anyone been, did anyone check Cameron Bergfeld? No. Uh, nobody has been there, this cute little... Uh, so when Ann and I were discussing this poll and she said, should I include that in it? And I said, well, gee, I've never been there, but I did go this morning, so... <laughs> <laughs> That's great. How big is it? It's really, well, it's like, it's in two parts. It's like uh, eight acres. One part, there's no access to it. It's all swamp. And the other part, there's about a 200 yard loop. So it's quite small. Uh, yeah. So Phil, I've, I've uh, just texted you. Do you have your phone? Uh, since we're having to piece our technology together here a little bit. And you can see the results of the second question, if you want to mention that. Okay, so 67% um, said they've noticed a lot of increase at, I'm having trouble reading it, Ann. Yeah, I know, the art technology thing didn't yeah. work. Um, well, I can read it. Um, yeah, I can see fine. You guys can see it fine, yeah. So we asked which sanctuaries have noticed significant increase. A lot of people ticked, uh, the ones that answered ticked uh, Brent and uh, a few people ticked prime. Yeah. Uh, sanctuaries are kind of uh, small to medium. Those are our <laughs> largest sanctuaries. We had reports that at Britain there were people parking down along the driveway to get in. Or yeah, that's down. So that's quite unusual usage for there. So we tried some signage, which seems to be working there. We have a multitude of signs up here at Prime to try to direct traffic and parking too and limit that. Uh, do you, you and how about the third question with the masks? Yeah, that's interesting. Um, so the uh, more, most people had answered uh, 50 to 75% of the walkers they've seen. Yeah. One said less than 25. Uh, a couple said 25 to 50. Yeah. Actually, one person said more than 75%. So that's interesting. So, so Val, Valerie, would, would that hint about um, wearing a mask and facing away while you're on the boardwalk, would you feel comfortable doing that or, or would you rather stay away for a while? That's a good question, Phil. Um, since somebody has reported that it seems that it's staying clear, um, I, I could go there and walk through it really quickly and then go on to the yellow and the white trails yeah. and uh, spend more time there. But um, there's never any litter on the boardwalk except yeah. dog poo that people haven't bothered to do anything about. Um, the leaves, uh, they're not going to be a problem during this season. Uh, what, what we're more likely to get are little branches that the squirrels have chewed off and mm -hmm. have dropped onto the boardwalk and that's not really a problem either. Um, I think it would be easy to walk the boardwalk but I don't know that I'd accomplish anything in doing it. Okay, okay. So I'm going to go back to sharing the screen now. Okay, can you see that? Yes, looks good. Uh, so again, uh, on, on safety, when you're using tools, you should uh, carry any extra tools in a backpack or something. You should wear eye or safety glasses and work gloves and long pants and proper footwear. I don't think you want to be going out sawing in uh, sandals. And you should stop working when others are nearby and, and let them pass. Um, now, when a trail walker goes out, we'll call that an inspection tour. Uh, we ask you to please pick up litter, so you should wear gloves and bring a trash bag for that. I think there's actually very little litter in most of the sanctuaries. There's one exception 
which is at the entrance of, uh, of Chode. It's on a busy road where, where a lot of people seem to throw beer bottles out the window. But on the trails, it's actually quite good. Um, if there are little branches on the trail, you can kick them aside and you should report problems to the office, preferably using the form that I mentioned before. And the problems would be either handled by an experienced volunteer such as myself, or as Dave mentioned earlier, we do have a, a professional sanctuary worker and handy, handyman, uh, Danny Ferguson, and he'll go out and take care of blowdowns. It helps when you report a problem to note the location accurately. And it's good if you can take a photo with your smartphone, if possible, those are usually GPS tagged and that helps to locate exactly where the problem is. So the kinds of problems to look for are, are down trees uh, blocking the trail and vegetation obstructing the trail. Um, the trail conference and others, uh, we like to have at least a four foot wide by eight foot high uh, trail corridor. So if there's vegetation growing into that, could report on that. Uh, persistent or, or wet muddy areas. Um, and we've actually recently addressed uh, several such problem areas. This was in, in Prine, it's a board, a punch and broad boardwalk that Dave and, and Rob and I and, and Michael Mattias put in a few weeks ago. This was on a, a, the white trail. It's a very heavily used trail. It's a really muddy section. It was getting, you know, you would sink in as you walked there and it was getting wider and wider as people walked around. So we put in this, uh, this boardwalk, we did it carefully using, you know, wearing masks and keeping our dis distance. You should report uh, damage to boardwalks. And if they're, if they're what you consider uh, major tripping hazards, maybe large roots. And poor trail blazing. And by this, we mean old faded paint that's hard to see. And when you're walking on a trail, ideally the next blaze should always be visible. So if that's not the case, uh, you could report it to us and uh, we can try to take care of it. Also, if there's uh, vegetation blocking the blaze, say a tree branch grows in, sprouts some leaves and, you can, and it's in front of the, the blaze. So that can be reported and taken care of. And you need to do this in, in both directions. Um, so you don't have to do that all on one trip. You could think about um, on different, uh, different outings, uh, do the trail in alternate directions. Then reporting, you want to um, uh, file a report soon after going out and the report should include uh, problems, unauthorized usage. We'll talk about that more. And if you, if you see wildlife or some unusual plants and, and maybe people uh, in a place that you don't usually see, you should feel free to report that. I, so for unauthorized usage, you should report that to the office promptly. And some of the things are bikes or motorized vehicles. We don't permit those on our, our trails. Uh, vandalism or graffiti. We had an unfortunate um, graffiti incident in Britain a couple months ago. Um, unauthorized hunting. That's actually quite rare. Uh, but in Britain, Prime and Chote, we do have authorized bow hunters out in November and December to help um, uh, keep the deer population down. Uh, they stay off the trails and they're usually there very early in the morning or late in the afternoon. Um, if you see dogs off leash or someone who appears to be a professional dog walker, uh, please report that. We've had uh, 
we had a few professional dog walkers. And if you're, if you can get a license plate, uh, that would help. For safety reasons, you really shouldn't confront trail users involved in unauthorized activities. And the possible exception is if you feel comfortable doing so, you could politely ask people to lease their dogs and explain why. So if you see a big bulky guy with a, you know, a pit bull, you probably don't want to ask him. But if you feel comfortable doing it, you could ask them to keep their dogs on a leash. And there are a bunch of reasons. First of all, they can be a threat to people, uh, even though everyone thinks their dog is, is, um, is friendly. And some people feel threatened by dogs. So even if the dog is friendly, people can still be threatened by them. Also, um, uh, dogs running loose can reduce wildlife habitat quality. And birds and other wildlife often see uh, dogs as predators and they'll leave uh, areas that are frequented by dogs. And these are sanctuaries we're meant to encourage wildlife so you don't want to scare it away. And they also can kill ground uh, nesting birds and small animals if they go off trails. And also, um, loose dogs that are running around, they're at risk from uh, primarily coyotes, which we do have in our sanctuaries. Uh, you can thank people if their dog is on a leash and say that you appreciate their doing so. And if you do talk to someone and get a negative response, please let the office know. And if you can describe the person and the dog, that would be helpful, and especially if it's a repeat offender, someone you've seen there before. I'm going to switch now to, to maintenance and uh, uh, go over some of the tools that we use. So for cutting back vegetation, you can use either a, a small hand pruner, a larger lopper. These are usually about maybe two to three feet long. You use with both hands and those can handle larger branches. And that's what I prefer to use as a lopper. Um, and in certain areas, you might want to consider an electric hedge trimmer. Uh, they're battery operated. If the vegetation is particularly thick, thick the one place that I can think of offhand that, um, that I've used a, a hedge trimmer at is the lower loop at, at Haas. It's got a lot of invasives growing there that come right up to the trail. Um, and then hand saws for clearing small blowdowns and branches, and again, no chainsaws. And these can, they can get dull after a few years or a lot of usage, so you have to either replace the blade or buy a new one. They're pretty difficult to sharpen. The one that I prefer is this folding saw uh, the, that it fits in your backpack and the, the blade uh, folds into the saw and folds out. So it's real easy to carry around. Uh, you might also consider a pruning saw. Uh, for this, you would need a, some kind of a holster or you could carry it around the whole time. But if you're carrying a saw and, a, and loppers, that can be a little awkward. Or a bow saw, and these, these actually can be a little bit longer than the folding saws. So uh, that, that can be useful. So when, when trimming vegetation, there are really two objectives. I mentioned before trimming branches that obstruct the view of the blazes and keeping the trail corridor uh, free of growth. So again, we want a four foot wide by eight foot tall trail corridor. And when you trim a, a branch, you want to trim it close to the trunk, but not into the trunk. And there are a couple of reasons for doing this. Primarily is to prevent sharp protrusions that can, can stick out. So if someone trips 
and you've cut you've cut the branch out further, there might be a sharp thing that they could uh, trip and fall into and say injure an eye. Uh, this is a trail conference uh, slide, and this shows here on the right. Uh, it's showing the you know four foot by eight foot corridor, and you'd say, well, I cut it here, and on the right, I'll cut it here, and then I've I've uh, cleared the the corridor. But that's bad for a couple of reasons. First, it might leave sharp branches, as we've discussed, but also that. It, it's going to grow back. These are rapid growth areas and you cut it there and it'll just grow back. So you'll, you'll be back out cutting it again after a short while. So the correct way to do it on the left is you would cut this branch close to the trunk here and then this small tree, you would cut it off at the ground. Here's some other examples. Um, uh, so here's, here's a branch. You can see it's coming out like this and growing into the trail. That's at about eye level. So you'd want to cut that branch about here. And then there's another one that's growing out here. I don't know exactly where that is, but somewhere, somewhere down here, well away from the, the trail. And with, with ground vegetation, um, you want to cut that as close to the ground as possible. Again, it'll, uh, re it'll, you won't have to cut it as often if you cut it close to the ground. And you should be, um, you should be proactive. Um, so if it's, uh, the, and these are often invasive. So if it's growing close to the trail, might not right be, be right on the trail right now, but it soon will be. So it's best just to just to cut it off on the ground. And I think this is Arnie. This was actually taken in Harriman last uh, last Saturday. <coughs> now for blowdowns, you want to clear small blowdowns, and a small blowdown. But that means it's something that you're com comfortable with. So it's something that's easily handled by your handsaw. And that's usually about eight to maybe 10 inches or so in diameter. And you may have to trim some branches uh, to get a, uh, be before you actually cut the blow down so you can easily get at the, at the, at the uh, trunk. You want to avoid cutting into the ground where there might be rocks and those rocks can, can damage your saw. And sometimes when you're cutting, the saw might seize up due to pressure. And if that happens, uh, remove it and, and cut from the other direction. And again, no chainsaws. And this picture on the right, this is an example of something that's too big to handle with a, with a handsaw. So you want to report that, um, note the position, take a picture if possible, and a sawyer will come out and, and take care of it. Okay, uh, blazing. So we'll talk about uh, a blazing sum. Um, so if you've never done it before, you can volunteer for a blazing crew. And if you're gonna go out um, and, and do blazing on your own, please let the office know that you'll be doing it. For the most part, we follow the standard uh, uh, blazing, um, uh, what, do you, what do you call those uh, diagrams? Um, patterns. So a straight is, is one blaze. Left turn is our two where one is to the left on the, the one on top is to the left. Here's a right turn. And then the start of the trail and the end of the trail. And a lot of people don't know the difference in the, the way to think about it is at the end of the trail, that looks like a V for victory. So again, the next, the next blaze should always be visible. You should use one of these turn blazes if the, if the trail is turning more than about 45 degrees. 
and right after a turn, you should put in a short, what we call a confirmation blaze, uh, shortly after the turn that just confirms that you're still on the trail. And um, you should pay special attention at intersections. People often get lost at intersections. And what you want is that it's well cleared and that the blazes are very near the inter intersection and can be seen uh, uh, from the trails. Um, you should use an exterior grade high gloss latex paint. And the, the standard blazes are two inches wide by three inches tall. Uh, the Appalachian Trail is different. I think that's six inches tall, but we don't have any AT sections in our sanctuaries. You want to use about a one inch brush or perhaps a two inch foam brush. I found that the brushes do better on trees than the, than the foam brushes. And you can use a scraper or a grill brush to smoothen the surface on the bark before you paint. So this is uh, just a grill brush here. You want to paint carefully to avoid drips. Um, and you can use a brown or gray spray paint to cover mistakes or old blazes. And you should plan a special trip just for doing blazing. Um, if you're out, you know, um, doing a lot of trimming and, and such uh, and blazing at the same time, it can be difficult. So do a special trip just for blazing. You want to blaze one direction at a time and then, then do the other one possibly on a different trip. And again, you want to um, trim back vegetation blocking the view of the blazes. And I didn't say it here, but you don't have to paint over the existing blazes if you feel there's a better place to say put a turn blaze um, than, than where one is, you can paint a new blaze and possibly um, cover up the old blaze. So in summary, uh, we'll send you a soft copy of these slides and a link to the recording. And thanks for your help and interest. And if you want to volunteer, um, and I encourage you to do so if you're not already, contact the office. Um, they'll probably put you in touch with me and we'll talk about uh, where, where you're interested in going and what needs to be done. We'd probably go out together on an initial inspection trip. And um, if, if you do have fun doing it, and are there any questions?